When should you enable snapshot isolation or read committed snapshot isolation for your SQL Server databases? For new applications that you're developing, I strongly urge you to consider enabling read committed snapshot isolation by default and to allowing snapshot isolation. Most people don't want to return incorrect data in SQL Server, and most people don't want blocking in SQL Server. So these can be really, really natural features. And the beauty of enabling them at the beginning is using optimistic locking can sometimes change the way that you write code. Some code that you may have in your legacy databases in SQL Server may have been written under the assumption that, hey, while I'm modifying data, I'm going to block anyone from reading it. And you may have some transactions that if you suddenly let people start reading committed versions of the data, you start hitting a race condition that returns incorrect results. This is usually something that can happen under read committed snapshot isolation because you're just changing the default isolation level for everything. This means that when you're doing a new application, if you start out with these issues and you're writing your code under the assumption that transactions can read committed data without being blocked by my update. In those situations, you test for them as you go and you don't have those situations created in your code. And this isn't a weird thing to think about as you code because other platforms like Oracle and other database engines, many of them default to optimistic locking. So there are many code patterns out there where people are used to thinking that, ah, people will be able to read committed data without having to wait because I'm holding a lock on it. You can absolutely use both of these. Since read committed snapshot isolation changes the default isolation level for the instance and it provides statement level protection, it can be useful for many situations. You, If you're starting out a new application and you have them both enabled, you're really only going to want to use snapshot for those times when you have an explicit transaction, you have multiple statements and they need to be consistent there. But for existing applications, we've gotta be careful. One thing is we may have underpowered storage under our tempdb, and we may have lots of wide rows and lots of updates running where there's a lot of versions and there large version information that can end up in tempdb. If we've got slow rotational storage under tempdb, then that may not be a great story depending on how much is going to end up in our version store, which is gonna vary a huge amount based on our data and our workload. We also have a potential for those race conditions with read committed snapshot isolation. If we just change everyone's default isolation level, there can be times when users start now getting a different kind of incorrect results. And this isn't just something that could theoretically happen. I know folks who have had this happen to them who enabled read committed snapshot isolation and it did solve a, bro a blocking problem, but then it caused a different data problem to happen and they had to go back and solve the problem a different way for an existing application. Sometimes they can, you can solve the problem if you have a blocking problem. Sometimes you can solve it with snapshot isolation. All hope isn't lost. But we do have to be careful about read committed snapshot isolation and, of course, about performance on our instance. Snapshot isolation can be really useful for existing applications. One of the ways that snapshot isolation can be useful is, let's say I, I'm interested in using snapshot isolation and I don't have a load testing environment. I mean, if I have a load testing environment or an environment where I can do replays, I want to use that to test out how many versions will I generate, right? So if I have an environment outside of production where I can test, absolutely do that too. But even after that point, when I want to deploy to production, I wanna go carefully. I don't wanna just start everything using the feature all at once. The feature for allowing snapshot isolation to happen, if you turn that on, versions immediately start being generated. You don't have to have anybody actually using snapshot isolation. So you can enable snapshot isolation and then look at, okay, what's my performance like now and compare it to a baseline that you did before you ever changed anything. You can also disable snapshot isolation with whenever you want because nobody has started using it yet. Now you're not gonna be 
seeing everything that will happen once you start using snapshot isolation because cleanup will not be impacted by potentially long running transactions using snapshot isolation. It'll be able to use cleanup based on when individual statements are done, but you will get to have an idea of, okay, what is usage in my version store going to be like and how does it compare with my baseline? Obviously you wanna do the baseline <laughs> before you turn this on too. There are ways that snapshot isolation just by itself can solve big blocking problems on existing applications. More and more, we have places where we need to run reporting workloads against an active OLTP database. This used to be a big anti-pattern, but these days it's incredibly common because our, our customers want information on what is my data like right now? They don't want to wait for an ETL process and for a data warehouse to load. If you're selling something and you have customers who are selling products on your site, those customers will want to know how many products have I sold right now, for example. That means running queries against a production database. And this has become easier with larger amounts of memory with solid state drives. So there's a lot of changes in technology that have made this more practical. Optimistic locking can really help out in these situations because I don't want my customer running a big report to cause a big blocking problem. I don't want them to get blocked by something updating a row either. If there are just a few parts of my application that are read-based parts of the application, and I'm like, yeah, I really just want these reports to not get blocked, snapshot isolation can help with that. If they're important enough to warrant doing versioning for all our changes, we can now say, okay, you're not gonna block rights, rights aren't gonna block you, and you are gonna get a consistent set of data, even consistent at the transaction level if we're doing begin tran and running multiple statements in there. And that can be really, really cool. Now, like everything else, there can be some gotchas here. Connection pooling is one of the biggest gotchas that we haven't mentioned yet, because let's say I have a couple small parts of my application that are very important that I wanna use snapshot and I'm starting to phase in set transaction isolation snapshot on them. I have already allowed this at the database level and tested it and made sure everything's good. So I'm slowly phasing in snapshot isolation. If, if my application uses connection pooling and I'm not resetting my isolation level, then I might be allowing snapshot isolation for a lot more things than I think. So we do have to be careful about that as you phase in using snapshot isolation to make sure that it doesn't leak out into your uh, connection pooling, that, that can be not so fun. So takeaways for new applications, for new databases, really consider starting with read committed snapshot and snapshot and make sure your team understands what that means in terms of blocking and make sure that you set up test cases for, okay, what happens if people are reading this during our modifications? Even in data warehouses, it is becoming more and more common for optimistic locking to be used because the days when we were able to have a big outage to update the data warehouse where nobody was reading it, those days are going away, even on data warehouses. We often have users who need to have access around the clock because they're around the world. And letting people query a data warehouse database during a data load <laughs> can be dicey because there may be lots of blocking. There may be data they're seeing in one place that's updated and data in another place that isn't updated. Using these isolation levels can help with that. But of course, we do have to make sure that we can withstand the performance impacts. And we also, for all of the times we knew it, we use this we need to monitor our version store. The third bullet point on this slide is about making sure that your tempdb doesn't fill up with garbage and impact your performance because maybe I do, maybe I am a user who comes in and I'm allowed to query the SQL server and I'm using snapshot isolation to try not to block people. And I, I set my transaction isolation level to snapshot and I do begin tran. And then I run a query. And normally I'm really good about like not leaving my session open, but I forget. 
right? And I maybe I don't even know what begin trend does. I've just kind of learned that as a pattern, right? But I leave my session open and it's open for like three days. Well, I'm gonna have three days of version buildup that may impact everyone. And this isn't just users who do this. So over the course of the years, I've run into many applications that have bugs that leave transactions sitting open. Whoops. You really want to monitor that. You want to baseline it and monitor it. There are some performance counters that make this much easier. Under the transactions performance objects, there's well just one of them. There are several of them that help you monitor transactions that are preventing cleanup. This isn't all transactions on the SQL server. It says longest transaction running time. It really means longest transaction running time that's impacting your version store. <laughs> that's just a little too long. But it will, you can baseline this counter and see what's normal for me. Even before you enable our CSI or snapshot isolation, you may still see version store usage because some features in SQL server like online index rebuilds may use the version store behind the scenes that in ways that you haven't noticed because you aren't monitoring this. So you want to baseline this and then you can set an alert that says, hey, if this gets out of a normal range, let someone know we need to go in and look at what are these long running open transactions and why, why is this much longer than normal. For existing databases, I often find that for fixing an existing blocking situation, it is less risky and easier to identify some of the components of, okay, who's in, we need to figure out first who's involved in this blocking mess. And then we can identify, would it be safe for this report or for this large query? Would it be safe for it to run under snapshot isolation and then walk through a process of, are we ready to test this and enabling that? That can be much easier because it doesn't change the default isolation level for the entire code base. Thank you for joining me for this session on snapshot isolation and read committed snapshot in SQL Server. I'm Kendra Little from SQLWorkbooks.com.